Hi, this is the Adverse Childhood Experiences video. Uh, we uh, are going to talk a little bit about what that actually means, uh, what now, what's going to happen because of what we're talking about, and next steps. I'm Vanessa Stein, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. My name is Daniel Garner Quintero. I'm one of the licensed mental health counselors and a certified clinical trauma professional at CAPS. So our goal in providing this presentation was to provide a little information about exactly what adverse childhood experiences are, what we refer to as ACEs, to talk about some of the potential impacts that ACEs um, can have, uh, to discuss the importance of resiliency and how to minimize um, the impact of those ACEs, and to talk about treatment options and resources that are available um, to the UCF community. So the ACE study was a pretty landmark uh, study uh, that kind of really furthered our understanding of kind of how early childhood experiences, specifically highly stressful or traumatic experiences, can shape um, our health trajectory moving forward. Um, so it's one of the largest investigations of childhood abuse and neglect that was done. It was done in two waves of data collection and included over 17,000 organizations um, from the, I believe the Southern California area um, that actually completed the physical exams and confidential surveys regarding these childhood experiences that were identified. And there are 10 of them that we'll go through. So what exactly are ACEs? Um, ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, um, and they are potentially traumatic events that occur in our childhood, so zero to 17 years. A couple of examples ex include violence and abuse, um, witnessing violence in the home or community, uh, family members attempting or dying by suicide, um, and they can uh, also include environmental factors, which can undermine a child's sense of safety and stability. So chronic or consistent substance misuse, um, untreated, undiagnosed, um, or like dysregulated mental health concerns, um, or instability within the household due to incarceration, parental separation, things like that. And what we discovered through, these, uh, through this ACEs study is that ACEs are linked to chronic health problems, mental illness, and substance misuse in adulthood. Um, I want to be very clear, we're talking correlative, not causational. Um, but regardless, the strength of the connection is very, very strong. Um, and we know that we can actually, there are things we can do to intercede to both prevent ACEs and reduce the impact of them. So, Three broad categories that fall within abuse, I believe. Um, emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. Um, uh, emotional abuse would be um, swearing at you, insulting you, putting you down, call, name calling, things like that. Physical abuse would be slapping, throwing, um, any hits that would leave a mark. Uh, and then sexual abuse would be in, include any kind of sexual touch, fondling, um, or, um, uh, in a, uh, or a penetration of any kind um, with, uh, with a minor. Household challenges would include um, mother, so in the ACEs survey, they focused on the mother violent mistreatment, so um, it's kind of heterosexual or heteronormative in its approach. Uh, but regardless, um, I would say kind of family violence, right? Substance abuse from the household, um, untreated or undiagnosed mental illness, um, parental separation or divorce, and an incarceration. And then the last, uh, I think this is the last one, uh, is neglect. Um, so uh, any kind of emotional neglect, um, not um, creating a sense of safety or love, uh, questions regarding kind of standing within the household, and then physical neglect, uh, failures to care for or protect, um, failures to kind of get medical treatment, failures to provide for basic needs, um, parents who are impaired due to substances, things like that. This is a little hard to read. So, um, so the three categories, like I said, are abuse, household challenges, and neglect. And you can see um, some of the um, information that was reported. Um, so the overall ACE score is between zero and ten, um, and uh, and we actually add up the scores. And so um, each area kind of gives you a different number. Um, so in this one, we can see the num the percentage that was reported of these different areas. Um, you can see physical and sexual abuse were, were um, fairly high, substance abuse was fairly high, uh, and emotional neglect was the highest in that category. So some of the findings, and we've kind of tried to put a little bit of, uh, of data in here, um, was that people who experienced four or more categories of exposure to these 
experiences had a four to 12 fold increased health risk for alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicide, a two to four fold increase in their risk for smoking um, or poor self related or self rated health, in other words, how they kind of uh, reported their health concerns. Um, greater than or equal to 50 or more sexual um, partners, um, higher risk for STIs and STDs, and a 1.4 to 1.6 uh, overall increase in physical inactivity or severe obesity. So again, these kind of really start to correlate to long-term health concerns um, and mental health concerns as well. Um, so again, mental, um, mental health, in, including depression, anxiety, um, kind of PTSD-like symptoms, dissociation, suicidality, things like that. And so this is kind of how we conceptually understand it, right? So, um, so the mechanism and kind of how this affects people from conception all the way to death. Um, so you can actually see prior to, if you look at the, um, the chart here, um, the adverse childhood experiences, there are there are contexts and conditions which kind of set this up. So both generational and systemic factors, um, like systemic racism and things like that, social conditions within the local context that a child is born, and then the actual adverse childhood experiences themselves. So the, num the, the larger the number of adverse childhood experiences, right, the greater chance that the neurodevelopment of the child will be disrupted, right? They won't learn socialization skills or they won't learn uh, emotional regulation skills. Um, they won't establish a sense of safety within their, their relationships, um, which um, impairs their overall development, which increases the, uh, risk, um, the risks they take later on, which leads to disease and disability, um, and then ultimately early death, um, as we see on this chart. So um, some factors to consider, right, when we're looking at resiliency, because um, again, it's not if you have an ACE score of four, like you're just in for the long haul, right? Um, there are things that can actually buffer that. So things would include um, supportive adult child relationships. So even if you have parents um, who were neglectful or abusive, if you had a really positive relationship with a youth pastor, with grandparents, aunt or an uncle, some kind of staple kind of adult figure, that has been shown to be a resiliency factor. Um, building a, a sense of self-efficacy and perceived control, so children who are able to find some kind of realm um, where they're able to exercise control over their, over their own life or, or kind of dictate some control, um, such as like academically exceeding there, um, show higher resiliency. Um, anytime we can help children develop adaptive skills or learn how to self-regulate, um, again, cultural traditions make a big difference. So um, indigenous communities that are rooted in those cultural traditions, uh, faith can be an important factor, um, especially positive faith communities. Um, and then things that actually help uh, with recovery would be developing healthy coping strategies and working with a mental health professional. So now what? Um, what we know from the research is that we have to focus on mitigating the immediate and long-term impacts of ACEs. So not, the study really talks about childhood, so the immediate kind of impacts, um, going into the schools, um, working with the teachers, kind of addressing in the communities the conditions that give rise to those ACEs. And it's really a multi-generational approach. So um, if there had been um, grandparents or parents who also had high ACE scores, kind of giving them parenting classes or talking about ways in the community that they can kind of um, start from the ground up to work on these different concerns. Um, and so what, what we learned from the research is that um, you have to intervene to sort of lessen the immediate and long-term harms. And so some of these kinds of things were uh, to enhance primary care outcomes. So building maybe clinics within schools. Uh, we have a really great example of that in our own community about what's going on in Paramore. Also, um, uh, kind of out by the um, hotels, like out in the Rosen area. We have kind of clinics that are within school systems. We also have victim-centered services. So thinking about like Victim Services Center of Orlando and other agencies, we'll get into the um, resources in a minute, but it's really places where people can go and get mental health support and treatment. Um, that in, so that's in both physical and mental health. Um, and 
including engaging in treatment to prevent future involvement in, in violence. So this looks like um, the Boys and Girls Club or community agencies, programs and things like that that go into the school's mentorship programs, whether that's faith-based or not. And then also a focus on the family, specifically around substance use. So we know that a lot of people who um, experience growing up in a family where there's substance use also um, take on kind of codependency traits or other things that might make them more susceptible to use in the future. So the study really looks at the whole person, the whole family, and the whole community. Very like holistic approach. And so we really wanted to talk about a specific example of a coping strategy. And so I liked this graphic because it talks about the different types of self-care. And that word sometimes gets a bad rap, especially when you think about um, what's said on social media or what's said in the media in general. But we, when we work on self-care, we're really looking at a variety of different areas in our life. So we've talked a lot so far about physical and emotional, but there's also social, spiritual, um, personal kind of goals and hobbies for yourself and space, and that's a really big one, especially for people who have experienced a significant amount of ACEs, is how they can find safety and stability now in their adult lives. Um, that can also include finances. So when we were talking about the sense of control, it's important to realize that you can have control over specific things, like maybe that's getting a job, maybe that's getting um, involved academically, so that those are not feeling out of control for you. Maybe that also includes work, you know, volunteering, getting an internship. If we focus on these different areas, we can also increase the person's ability to be resilient and to cope farther ahead, even in the future when other new problems come up. Um, and so the next steps or what we think about are some treatment options. Uh, there really is um, some, in the research specifically, they talk about trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And this helps effectively reduce PTSD symptoms. It helps reduce depression and anxiety. It can address shame. And it can also address behavioral problems, especially when targeted towards kids. Um, it can also reduce parental distress. So if you're a parent and you're trying to, um, you know, parent young children, how can you um, make those relationships stronger, which is also a resiliency factor in preventing ACEs from continuing the cycle. Multisystemic therapy, also um, in the research, demonstrated both short and long-term benefits. Um, it helped reduce things like crime, drugs, sexual behavior, and strengthen protective factors. So that's really more in the community level. The research talked about kind of um, going into the school systems and the community agencies to do that. We know that there's a lot of treatments for trauma reprocessing, and so for people who have experienced some of the um, abuses and neglect and family situations, they can go as adults um, to get this uh, trauma processed out of their body and to help kind of heal. And some of the biggest ones are EMDR and uh, art, as well as tapping, prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy. And what we learned from the research that, is that it's all related to uh, the way that your memory is coded in your brain. And so when memory comes out of your brain, each new time you recall the memory, it changes a little bit. So you can use bilateral stimulation, which is basically eye movements back and forth, to help you reprocess the memory and give it a different um, a kind of a different experience. You're never gonna forget the memory or you're never gonna forget the facts, but you're gonna change the way that you react to the memory when it happens. So all of these treatments are things that you can seek out if, you, um, if that's something you're struggling with, or it's just good information to know if you wanna be able to refer someone or help someone else that you um, know in your family. I would also point out real quick before yeah. you change that, uh, on that last slide, most of those um, forms of therapy are available here at CAPS. We have yeah. EMDR, ART, PE, and CPT trained clinicians. Yeah, um, for sure. I don't know about tapping, um, but the rest of them for sure. I think we've got a couple of therapists who maybe dabble in tapping. Yeah. Um, but the rest of them I know for a fact are represented on staff here at UCF. Yeah, that's a great... Um segue to our next slide, because I'm going to talk specifically oh. <laughs> about what's available at UCF, right? Yeah. And so when we think about the physical pieces, student health services is obviously our primary 
um, health clinic on campus for students. And so you can access primary care. We have a pharmacy. We also have a substance use clinic that's part of behavioral health, which includes psychiatry. We do neurofeedback. Um, and then wellness health promotion services kind of takes the holistic uh, model again, looking at health from a variety of different factors. And so they offer biofeedback, smoking cessation programs, nutrition coaching, HIV testing. So um, student health services is sort of like that they treat the problem that may already exist and wellness health promotions helps work to prevent problems or to help offer support for people who wanna make behavioral or lifestyle changes. And then talking about our CAP specific re resources. Yeah, Daniel mentioned that we already have some trauma reprocessing. We're hoping to get that resumed in the spring or maybe the summer. Uh, it's difficult to do some of those therapies over telehealth. The research doesn't really support it yet, but we're working on different ways to try to either refer people for those specifics or asking you know, for them to be able to come back and see us in a future semester. We have a variety of group therapy options too. I thought it was me group is really focused on people who have experienced family distress um, codependency concerns, um, growing up with alcoholic or substance using family members, uh, and it's a focus on kind of understanding your own sense of self and control. We also have a women's family group that really focuses on kind of reparenting and helping women who have grown up in difficult family situations. Our Seeking Safety group focuses on people who struggle with both mental health conditions and substance use. So it's a dual diagnosis or co-diagnosis support. Our women's empowerment group is focused on those who have experienced sexual trauma, um, and it's uh, really a safe place. People who have participated in that group have to have some ability to regulate emotions and tolerate distress, but it's a very open and supportive group. And then we also have a specific men's group too, uh, so that men can work on um, kind of understanding and dealing with toxic masculinity and um, focusing on understanding their own emotions. We have uh, some uh, workshops as well. So uh, I do a DBT workshop. We're actually in the middle of it. Our next one is coming up later this week. And we focus on emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, um, distress tolerance, and mindfulness, giving really specific tools. Uh, we have an alcohol and substance use workshop focusing on reducing uh, harm to those kinds of different things. So a harm reduction model. We have mindfulness workshops every Wednesday, a midweek mindfulness. We have stress management workshops, and we have workshops focused on sleep. And we highlighted these specific workshops because we think that they're connected and tied back to um, people who may struggle with um, all of these kinds of mental health concerns or physical health concerns that come from having higher ACE scores. So it's important to know that um, this was deliberate and kind of um, exploring some of the specific things that we have at CAPS and not everything is listed here. There's a variety of other resources that we have available. Um, in our community, we have some really um, great local options. Peer support space um, is an actual location, but they've been working um, remotely and offering virtual support spaces twice a day. You can call in and get on a Zoom call 12 o'clock and 6 p.m. if you're just looking for general support or unsure about if counseling is the right fit for you and you just kind of want to try it out. We also have Al-Anon and CODA groups. So Al-Anon is um, a section of kind of AA and NA, which are Alcohols Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, but Al-Anon is really focused for the family. So anybody in, who has grown up in a family or has a partner or a significant person in their life who has struggled with substance use, it's a great place to get support. And CODA is for Codependency Anonymous. So it's also, again, people have struggled in those kinds of relationships where family were maybe enmeshed or um, difficult connections, having trouble setting boundaries, those kinds of things. Uh, and that's the same thing with ACOA. That stands for Adult Children of Alcoholics. And I would really say that it's any kind of substance. They focus on helping people manage and um, go through those kind of difficult family um, situations. Uh, and all of those uh, support groups are actually working online right now. And you can go to the national web uh, sites and look up where you are in your local resources and kind of join those groups. Uh, and they're all anonymous and they're all kind of regular standing. I know that there's been a um, Al-Anon group in my community where I live every Wednesday night at a local church for a long time. And I've referred many people there as needed. Um, as well, and I've also referred clients there. It's been very helpful. 
Yeah, and so we just wanted to just give you a list of some other references if you wanted to look at the research a little bit farther or if you had questions specifically about some of the things that we talked about in this video. Oh, and we had an evaluation link uh, listed because we were planning on doing this as a live outreach. If you found this video helpful and you have any feedback for us, we would love for you to submit um, uh, to this uh, evaluation and let us know if you have any other thoughts or things that you'd like to hear uh, for future videos. As a reminder, this is also how you connect with us at CAPS. We have uh, all of our social media sites. You probably found this video on YouTube or saw a link to it through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And then as a general reminder, we also have a crisis hotline. So you can reach a counselor 24 seven. So during the business hours that we are open, there's a counselor on duty available. And nights and weekends, you just press option five after you call this number and you can get connected to a counselor even if it's three o'clock in the morning. So we appreciate you taking the time to um, listen to this video and to kind of learn a little bit more about ACEs. And please uh, call CAPS and schedule services if you have any questions or would like to talk to a therapist about this more.